Today is part seven of our Stratocaster build series, and we're gonna be focusing on the body. Like Mr. Plant once said, it's been a long time since I rock and rolled. Been a long time since I did the stroll. It's been a long time since I did a YouTube video. But here we are. I know you guys are anxious to get on with part seven. It's been a while since I finished up part six of the Stratocaster style guitar build series. If you want to go all the way back to, I think it was 2018, may, no, maybe 2019, summer of 2019, I ended up doing a video called Steve's Soapbox. And in that video, I basically kind of went on a little bit of a rant about how important time is and, and prioritizing time uh, when you have more to do than you have time to do it. And if you refer back to that video, I, I said that the lowest on the priority list for me is doing YouTube videos, that I'll do videos whenever I have something to say and the time and energy to do it. And it's the latter that I have. And I have got tons to show you folks, and I've got tons that I wanna talk about, um, but the time and the energy just hasn't been there for many reasons in life, and this teaching that I do, which occupies a lot of time in addition to other activities that I still had to keep going. And really it was, uh, there was nothing left. There was nothing left of me. There was nothing left of my time. So now things have changed a little bit and that semester is over. It freed up about 20 hours a week of my time, which is gonna not all be used for YouTube videos, but I will try to use a little bit of it to kind of stay with this project and see it through to the end. Plus, I'm gonna end up doing as many videos as I can on some really new, cool uh, jigs and templates and things like that that I've been, uh, I've been designing and making and selling uh, on the website. So I'll share with those with you in the future, but today we wanna really get back to talking about the Strat build, and we're up to the point in step seven of talking about the body. If you haven't received the task sheets that I offered um, way back when I started this series, all you have to do is send me an email and ask for the documentation that goes along with this build series and I will send it to you, okay? That's all I'm asking is that you have to directly ask me for it. Now. Some of you might have sent me emails and never heard back from me. And if there are a few of you, I apologize. I found that some of the emails have been going into my junk folder. And if I don't look at them and clear them out of there within 30 days, they're automatically deleted. So if you've, if you've ever written me and not gotten a response, that's why. So what I would encourage you to do is go to the website, which is listed in the information below, and on the website, you will find contact information for me. And use the email link in order to send me that request or anything else that you might have uh, needed from me. And I have had almost no problems with emails going through my website uh, getting to me, as opposed to I have had some issues with emails that have come directly to me and have been some, somehow classified as spam. If you've been following this series, you'll remember that Parts one through six have been all about the neck and getting up to really having a completed neck ready for a finish at some, some point in time in the future. Now we've got to get the body caught up to that. And I'll also remind you that this series is set up to be most beneficial to the students at the class that I teach, electric guitar making class at my local community college. And, and this will be paralleling that instruction. In fact, these documents are the same, you know, parts lists and outline tasks to be completed each week is all in these documentations, but that's the same thing that's used um, when I teach the college course on this. And so we're paralleling that. And just to, because it's been a while, just to kind of 
remind everybody that I have certain assumptions that I make when I have a student come to me. He has a basic foundation of woodworking uh, because they've had to go woodworking 101. And, but there's still maybe some people that are new enough to woodworking that they don't know a lot about the ins and outs. And so I teach this at, at a fairly elementary level. So, so if you're beyond that and more advanced, then I apologize, but I, I try to keep it pretty simple and I tend to be pretty descriptive, which many of you commenting like, so that works out pretty well. Uh, so today, if you're following along with the uh, task by episode, what it talks about is getting to the point where you've got the, the body glued up, uh, that you've thickened the body blank, uh, you can trace the template, um, and practice making a neck pocket in something like poplar or some other inexpensive, easy to work with uh, wood. Well, I'm going to skip the the practice of the, of the neck pocket, uh, because you'll have to do that on your own. But what we're gonna get into today is the things that lead up to getting your body blank ready to machine. So one of the first things we need to talk about is different types of wood for electric guitar body blank. So some of those most common woods historically has been swamp ash, uh, also, also what they call Southern Ash, um, and, and Alder have been a big one. Um, in certain fender models, uh, Pine has been used, Poplar has been used, um, Basswood. Uh, there's really a lot of different woods that you, can, you could use in a fender style guitar. And there's a couple different ways you can source it. You can buy body blanks. You can buy a body blank that is already glued up to approximate dimensions of maybe 13 and a half, 14 inches wide, and maybe 20 to 22 inches long, something like that. And generally, they're about 1 and 15 sixteenths total, total thickness when you buy a blank. And you can certainly do that to start off. But you can also go to your local hardwood supplier. I, I say hardwood supplier just so people don't get it confused with a home improvement store. Okay, they're not gonna have what you're looking for. So in my town, we've got several hardwood supply places. And typically they're gonna have a lot of the wood that we would wanna use for electric guitar making. They're gonna have the maple, um, if you're using that for, for necks. They're gonna have the poplar. They're gonna have basswood. They're gonna have alder for sure. And these are all fairly affordable woods. They probably won't have the southern ash. They'll probably only have the northern ash. At least that's what my local stores have. And, and the thing you gotta, you gotta focus on is when you're building a guitar, there's a lot of things to consider about the body. And I would argue that one of the least important things is what type of wood you're gonna use for your body. And the reason I say that is because Leo Fender picked the woods out based upon availability and affordability. And a lot of those woods have changed over the years, but the guitars are excellent guitars. And the biggest struggle that you will have with building a guitar is not whether you use alder or swamp ash or basswood, or poplar, or whatever other wood that you wanna use, but it's gonna be in the craftsmanship overall. And part of the craftsmanship, I believe, comes into ergonomics. We want woods that are gonna be stable, that's for sure, and not woods that are gonna be bowing and, and changing with every change of humidity level or temperature or things like that as much as other woods. But the critical thing is trying to create a guitar that has great playability. And certain things to me lend itself to great playability. And one of the things that I focus on a lot in the education process of the students is balance. Okay, I want to have a guitar that feels good either on a strap or on my knee that is balanced well, doesn't have the neck dive, 
um, or isn't so heavy that you get tired just playing it for 15, 20 minutes. All right, so these things I believe are probably to me, more important than what specifically type of wood that you use. Now, different type of woods will have minor characteristic differences, but it's not, not one over the other is gonna make a great guitar versus a crappy guitar. You know, they're all little things are gonna add up to make an instrument what it is, but sometimes what it is is different. It doesn't mean one is better than the other or things like that. But other things we need to consider as a guitar maker is we need to consider about machinability. Machinability of the, of the woods directly will tie to how good of an instrument are we gonna have in the end, based upon our skill level and the tools that we have available to use. All right, so let's talk about a few of these woods right here. Uh, we have a slab of alder. Now this, yep, this is actually a one piece, a one piece slab of alder. Uh, it's got a few defects in it, but, but not enough that I think that is gonna become an issue or a problem. In fact, I will tell you that I'm actually gonna build two bodies because I wanna show you two different ways to incorporate this Strat style of guitar. One is gonna be a very traditional top mounted pick guard version of the Strat. The other one is going to be a, a rear access, a rear cavity, um, Strat shaped guitar. Um, so they're gonna look a little bit different. The rear cavity version is not anybody's version. It was just my take on what that was is gonna be for for the cavities and the knob layout and things like that. And, and that's totally my own creativity coming into play for that. We're gonna stick pretty traditional for the top loaded one. All right, so we're gonna get a chance to see two different styles of construction um, within the same line of guitar, which I think will be pretty interesting. And I'm gonna vary the woods and the techniques to go along with that to show you basically how one method over the other uh, requires different skills or possibly different sets of tools. Alder is a wood to me that is not too heavy, but it's definitely a lot heavier than basswood. Um, and it can get borderline on too heavy, depending upon what the weight of your neck is and how well it's gonna balance. This neck that we already built is really not that heavy. I, I've, I've calculated the weights, I've actually recorded them, written them down, and I've got a goal in mind for a body that I want to be a good match for that neck. This one may be a little bit too heavy, uh, but it is certainly a pretty conventional wood to use, and I think once we clear out uh, the cavities and we do something a little bit unique with this guitar, it's gonna lighten up um, the wood a lot. So in the end, this may be a decent weight and certainly the alder is, is a perfectly acceptable and pretty affordable uh, type of wood to use for making an, a Fender style guitar. Whatever I do for this guitar is gonna be an opaque finish. So I'm not worried about the grain, I'm not worried about any defects in here because they're gonna be filled and they're gonna be painted with a solid color and and this is just for structure, and this is a very stable wood. Uh, some of the complaints we hear about the alder is it has a tendency to tear out on the end grain or to show checking and cracking you know, on the end grains. Uh, that's something that certainly you have to manage. Uh, but again, because of the type of finish we're gonna use, this wouldn't be a problem. So the alder would be a pretty good choice. Uh, the next wood I have here is basswood. Now basswood to me isn't as as pretty maybe as the grain and alder, certainly not of, of the swamp ash, uh, but there is benefits. Machining wise, it machines very easily. Sometimes it gets little fuzzies and it requires a little extra sanding above, you know, above the, the normal amount after machining it with tools, but um, it is lighter wood. And the weight of this will make a, a guitar that might border on the heavy side to be a lot lighter. 
And so this could be an appropriate choice for us if that was one of our biggest concerns is dropping the weight. Now we also have to look at it, is it too light? What if I use balsa wood? Okay, I wouldn't, but it would be too light, okay? And if the body is too light and the neck would be normal, you know, hard rock maple, then you are gonna get an, an, a balance problem. So the basswood I think is pretty good if you're especially gonna use a good solid trim system with that, with that big hefty weight in there and, and if you're using other components that may be a little bit heavier, then it's gonna balance off pretty well by using this type of wood. And, and I think this is a pretty nice wood to work with. And again, it's a pretty affordable. I think it's even a little bit less than maybe the alder in current day prices, which everything has gone up, unfortunately. Now this also happens to be a two piece. Okay, so there's two halves of an eight quarter blank of basswood that, were, that was basically cleaned up, glued together, and then plain flat. And it's still gotta be dimensioned to whatever dimension we're gonna use, um, but this is part of the prep process. Okay, two piece versus one piece. My thoughts are, if the guitar is, is gonna have some type of clear or transparent finish to it, and it's got really amazing grain, a one piece can look pretty cool. However, not really the most important thing. It is perfectly acceptable, perfectly normal, even if it's highly figured to have a seam you know, in the center joining those two pieces together. So that's certainly uh, perfectly fine. If you go to a three piece with highly figured wood, I'm not as much of a fan of that. Um, however, when you go to a two or a three piece, you're gonna have an increase of stability of that wood because, and we'll talk about this later, but after we cut the boards to size, we can flip the grains so that one grain is going this way, one grain is coming this way, and the two fight against each other. Okay, and with the three piece, again, you'd be doing, you know, the one seam coming together this way and the other seam coming together this way. And again, they're fighting against each other and it's gonna have better stability overall. So there's benefits to having a two or three piece system. Uh, most of the benefits of a one piece is aesthetics. It can have a negative and that is the, the wood may be less stable, it may be prone to, to cupping more so as one piece than as two piece. It just depends on how, how stable the grain is, um, how well it's dried, uh, and certainly if we're sealing it in with a finish is how well we seal it and prevent moisture from interacting with it. So basswood I think is a pretty good choice for uh, a Fender style guitar for sure. Now here's one of my personal favorites right here. And this is what's called torrified, or what you'll be commonly, or what will be commonly referred to as roasted basswood. So these two are the exact same species of wood, but one is dried in a kiln, and the other one is, is kiln dried and then is roasted. And the roasting process or torrification processes um, basically burns off a lot of impurities. It, it kind of changes the molecular structure of the wood so that moisture does not have as much of an impact on it as, as, as humidity level, levels change, temperature changes, things like that. So it's, it's a more stable wood. The trade-off of that is it's a more brittle wood. It doesn't have anything to do with playability. In fact, if you talk about just the tonal quality of the wood, if you did a, a little tap tone on a torrified piece of basswood compared to a non-torrified piece of basswood, you're gonna find the torrified is a lot more lively. The brittleness, though, makes it harder to machine. If you do not have super sharp tools or if you're doing certain practices that you've gotten away with on regular maple or other, other woods, you may not get away with it with a torrified piece of wood. It may has a tendency to, to chip out and splinter and things like that if your tools are not the right tools and are not sharp enough. So you really have to be careful about how you machine it. You may have to stop the machining process short 
of where you want to be and do more sanding uh, just in case there's a little chip out. You don't want to risk the, uh, the tools causing damage that is within the confines of, of your final dimensions, okay? So you wanna get all that done first and then maybe do more sanding. So that is totally up to you and how you wanna handle that, but it is fast becoming one of my favorite woods, even in the torrified world, is a piece of torrified basswood I think is, is primo. So we've talked about one piece bodies, two-piece and three-piece bodies. Well, the next one that I'm gonna show you is a nine-piece body, also known as a cutting board. <laughs> Actually, it does resemble that a little bit. And for bass guitars, a lot of people love that cutting board look, but in electric guitars, it's not very popular. However, this is what I'm calling my environmental body series. And the reason I'm saying that is because I have these cutoffs from all the different other bodies that I'm assembling together and I couldn't see just throwing or burning that wood. It's all good musical wood that was otherwise gonna be wasted because it wasn't big enough for anything. So I got, I salvaged nine pieces of that wood and I kind of separated it so it was all by like size and mirror image of itself. So it will be appealing at least in symmetry. But this is gonna be one of the blanks I'm gonna use for one of my bodies. Now I will tell you that I'm gonna put a top, a decorative top on this and I am gonna tint the back to kind of mute um, the, the stripes of it, but it still will be visible. This is the body wood that I'm gonna use for the rear cavity Strat style guitar. A solid piece versus a one with a drop top, okay? The drop top being the forearm contour, we are, whatever we put on top, we're gonna wanna bend over that forearm contour to follow the top of the guitar. And, and it's gonna be maybe about a quarter inch, plus or minus a little bit. Um, and we could use a flamed maple, quilted maple, things like that. We could use a lot of different decorative woods. And it really works itself great with the rear access, rear cavity, um, stress style guitar, because I won't use a pick guard. So whatever figured or decorative top I put on here, Without the pick guard, you will see a lot more of it, and that, I think, is a pretty cool thing. Many of you have not noticed, but in the past several months, I was able to acquire a pretty sizable amount of walnut directly from California. And some of it's Claro walnut, some of it is English walnut, and some of it is walnut burl. Now, I will tell you that uh, I've got a lot of the Claro walnut listed on my website, and I've got some on other places to sell too, uh, because it's more than I will ever use in building building guitars for Maxim Guitar Works. So I figured I'd make some available to other, other folks. So let me show you a couple samples of this Claro Walnut. These are all book matched in house. And I'll just kind of hold them up together. Obviously they're not glued yet, but hold them up and you can kind of see Hopefully you can see through the angle and the distance, but there's incredible figure and there's incredible striping on these. This is a really cool, highly desirable piece of Claro Walnut. And, and this could just make a great looking top as these colors kind of tie into some of the colors that we have in this block of wood here. That one is what I would call grade four. Grade four being Highly figured, um, but not like over the top, like, like a burl uh, would have, but really gorgeous figure, no defects, no holes or cracks to fill in and things like that. It's, it's ready to go. And it's about 300 thousandths thick, so 0 0.30, so greater than a quarter inch, which gives you room to play. Here's a close up of what I would call a grade, a solid grade four piece of Claro Walnut, the colors, the range of reds and browns and tans, the figure going all the way throughout 
that slab of wood is just stellar. No flaws, ready to be glued up and make an absolute gorgeous top on any guitar. Now let me show you a different one. This one would probably be like a grade one, maybe a grade two actually. Uh, it's a little bit thinner, just under a quarter inch. It's a little thinner, just under a quarter inch. Let me hold these up together. But this one has got the figure in it and it's got the striping in it and a really cool look, but it's got natural stress cracks in it here. That lowers the grading value, but it doesn't lower the interesting appeal of the wood. Because now you can choose to fill that, and you could fill it with black, you could fill it with colors, you could fill it with sparkle, you could fill it with all sorts of other things to add a little bit of exotic beauty to an already exotic natural piece of wood. And so it's something that shouldn't intimidate you when you find these tops that maybe aren't graded as, as high. There is a lot of beauty there that other people are gonna find and what you do with these natural cracks is totally up to you. It is certainly as stable as the other piece of wood, uh, but once you fill those cracks, it'll kind of give you that accent uh, to it. So this is kind of a, maybe a grade two on a scale of one to five and the other one was a grade four on that same scale. Here's a close up of what I would call a grade two. With this much stress fractures, I, I would maybe grade it as a level one. However, the colors, and again, the figure that is contained in here is pretty extraordinary. So I think even filling these with some sort of uh, epoxy um, or, or, or color added um, is, is gonna be still a very intriguing and very uh, enjoyable guitar. So we're calling this a grade two. I'm having trouble choosing which one should go on top of this guitar. So here's what I'm gonna do. Okay, this is important. What we are gonna do is allow you, my viewers, faithful viewers, I should say, if you're still subscribed to my channel, even though I haven't put out a video in a while, and we're gonna allow you to decide which top from my website is going to go and be used on here. It can be a grade one or grade two, it can be a grade four, I don't have any grade fives listed yet, um, but it could be any top. And I'd like to see comments, go to the website, get the product ID number, it's gonna be a number like 103101 Charlie one, that's this one. Get that ID number, write it in the comments, and if I get any comments uh, as to which top you would like to see me use in the construction of this guitar, um, I'll use it. If I get more than one comment, <laughs> and we'll go with the one that's most popular, or maybe a vein, if, if it can't, nobody can agree, but everybody likes the ones with the cracks in it, then I'll go with that. Okay, but whatever you would like to see. In the end, when I finish these guitars, and, and, and it's completely sprayed and buffed back, or whatever the type of finish that I'm gonna be using on them, um, it's gonna blow you away the beauty of this Claro Walnut. Within, let's say six days from the airing of this video, okay, the seventh day I'm gonna be shooting another video and I'm gonna start using that piece of wood. So get the comments in there as quick as you can and help me decide what should go with my environmental friendly, not wasting a single scrap of wood body uh, and a top to go on that body. Could be pretty crazy. Uh, for the solid, which is gonna have an opaque finish, I'm gonna go with the alder, okay? I just think that's gonna be a great wood uh, for a solid opaque finish, and I think the weight is gonna be fine. It may be slightly on the heavy side, but because of some of the techniques I'm gonna be using here, I think we're gonna be good. So I'm gonna go with the alder for this one. Many of you know that I've been selling templates now for about a year, and 
I didn't set out to do it, but they've really taken off and become very popular and it occupies a lot of my time uh, in building these, but it's, it's well worth it because the features that I have designed when I de first designed these templates for the students of my class in order to give them more accurate and safer templates are now available to the masses, making guitar building, I'd say more rewarding with less stress and less frustration, uh, and certainly the safety features because in the end, that's what's most important. You can make the most beautiful guitar in the world, but if you had to give up a finger to get it, I think you decide that it's probably not worth it. But if you use proper safety protocols and you respect the machines, um, you can do some amazing things and have a lot of satisfaction that you get from, from a hobby or a business or whatever you want it to be. And it can be extremely rewarding for you and for someone else potentially playing your instrument. So I've been selling these templates for a while. Now, I've, I continually make improvements and upgrades to these templates. So what I did for this episode at this point is I just printed off two brand new sets of templates with all of the new improvements and features. Um, and and I, I can't remember what changes from you know one month or one quarter to the next. I mean, I just, whatever new thing comes out, I, I just incorporate it into it. Um, for instance, I did switch over from having holes designed to, to drill through the template and, and create a hole for a potentiometer of 3 8 or whatever um, to a hole that is 1 8 where you use a steel punch to go in that hole and to locate where where the hole is going to be, then you can drill with any size hole that you want. And that was for two reasons, that improvement. Number one, um, drilling through the template is going to wear it out unless it's specifically designed to drill, like my off-body alignment pins are hardened steel, um, hardened steel drilling bushings that won't wear out. They're designed to be drilled uh, through to create perfect alignment pin holes. But these other ones are not, and the acrylic would wear out and it would become sloppy over time. The other reason for changing my thought process is some people use metric pots, like alpha pots are a common use, and those are gonna have a shaft that needs about a seven millimeter hole, where, where the CTS pots and, and other ones like that um, are gonna require a three eighths inch hole for the potentiometer shaft. So by punching those locations allows you to identify the, the precise spot and put a little dimple there for a brad point drill bit to track into, but not wear out your template and not lock you into using one type of hardware versus another. So those were that's one of the main improvements I made to this set, but this happens to be the rear access version here that I'm gonna be using that has a lot of special features that I'm gonna go over as we go through this building process, and it even includes the ability for the neck pocket jig to also do under drop top wire routing channels so that you can have an easy job rather than trying to drill holes after the fact. You can put all of those slots in there before the top is glued on, then you have a place to run all your wires. So that's kind of a cool thing about that set. And then the other standard one is, is, is your very traditional set that's designed to use a pick guard over top of it. Um, and, and the same thing with the back cavity and, and the neck pocket. It also has the electronics cavity, which is a little bit deeper than the pickups, which is why I separate them out on different templates. All that is built into here. And the other thing I'm going to use on this project uh, that I think is kind of a cool thing, it's a template that I developed for a gentleman up, upon request uh, who was about to attend a class uh, building a fender with uh, my friends at Texas Toast, uh, but he wanted a swimming pool style of a fender um, routing. So what I did is I created a two-piece set that does the main swimming pool and then one that allows you to use a bushing guide to do uh, little extra recesses if you're going to be using like humbuckers and need that extra little uh, space for the feet. All right, so um, so that's what I'm going to be using, which is going to be a cool thing to demonstrate the swimming pool um, template system 
that goes perfectly with and aligns with the alignment pins of the Strat series. Um, however, because I'm using the alder wood, I think it will remove a little bit more material, which may play to my advantage weight wise too. So that's kind of the little secret weapon that I'm gonna use to help bring this down in line a little bit better. If you're not familiar with my templates, they're all made out of quarter inch high quality acrylic with all those special features like the off body alignment pin, hardened steel, drilling bushings, and things, and things like that. You can go on the website and you can read all about them if you're not familiar. They were brown, not because they're made out of something brown, just because I haven't peeled the paper off. I shipped them to folks with the paper still on it to protect them a little bit. Um, and then they'll just have to remove the paper before, before they use them because part of the benefit of using acrylic is you can see all of your lines directly through it. Now, what are we gonna work on today, okay? Because we've done a lot of time of talking about different types of woods um, and ones that you may want to choose to use or to experiment with. Um, but now let's get into the construction and what is on the agenda for for part seven of this series is to talk about getting your body blank ready to go. So if you went out and bought raw eight quarter lumber or from some companies, if you order uh, a two piece top, it will come looking something like this. Now this just happens to be uh, black ash that has been torrified. So this is roasted black ash right here. It's gonna have all the same qualities of the swamp ash as far as really cool grain in there that's gonna really make a statement, uh, but it's heavier. It's, it's got some heft to it. Now, it just so happens I got an order for a Tele style rear access, rear cavity, no pick guard, Tele style guitar um, with, with many other very specific things that I need to do it for. But in, in discussing with my client as far as um, type of wood to use and things like that, he, he stated specifically that he didn't mind a heavier guitar. In fact, he prefers it over a guitar that's too light. So I, I thought this is the perfect one. Uh, black ash, torrified, it's gonna be very stable. It's gonna be a little bit on the heavy side, although I may lighten it up a little bit with some weight relief techniques. Uh, it's gonna be a bound guitar, okay? So the binding gives me, gives me a little bit of ability to, to do certain things that maybe otherwise you wouldn't be able to do which is with a guitar that's gonna be a somewhat transparent finish. Um, but this gives me something good to talk about and to show you as far as getting this material ready for glue up. So if we lay these down and we look at them, this is a pretty good match right here. This is the grain that I was talking about. We would like to have the grain opposing each other and that way the forces will equalize each other out. But it doesn't have a super stellar joint right here. There's some uh, gaps. It's, it's gonna be an obvious crack in there that we don't want. Uh, but if that wasn't there, this grain lines up pretty good in this orientation. You can see it, it was kind of like a book match. It, it came off of the same part of the tree. All right, so that, that looks really nice. But in prepping our body blanks to glue up, we have to consider a lot of things. Now again, I'm teaching this class as I would the students that I have at school. There's certain abilities that they have, there's certain tools that they have access to that I'm making an assumption that you might have access to. Uh, if you don't, then you might have to be get creative in figuring out ways to do it. But in order to glue this up, the first thing that we're gonna need to do is we are gonna need to, to really clean these, clean these up. Now, the proper way to clean these up is to use a jointer. And when I say using the jointer, I'm not just talking about getting the edges smooth and clean so we get a tight joint there. I'm talking about running one face across that jointer to get it flat and then using that reference side against the jointer fence so that I can make one edge perfectly square 
and then doing the exact same thing with this one so that when they come together, we have a perfect flat and tight joint. Any deviations to the thickness of the wood is gonna be on the top side. And then after the glue up process, we can run this through a planer. And the job of the planer is then to thickness the boards to be a consistent thickness. Okay, a planer will not make things flat. If you have a twist in a board and you run it through a planer, it is gonna have a tendency to follow that twist and all you're gonna end up with is a thinner board that still has a twist in it. That is where the jointer comes in. Now these are gonna be about seven inch wide slabs. If you don't have an eight inch jointer, you may have a hard time doing that. So you have to figure out. Now at the school, they've got a 12 inch jointer. So that is a doable proposition to be done at the school. And then they have, once it's glued up, it's about 14 inches. Bare minimum, you're gonna want 13 inches, so that means a 12 inch planer isn't gonna work. Well, they've got 16 and 20 inch planers at the school. So either one of those would work uh, once it's glued up, okay? So this is the thing. You may have a six inch joiner. Your decision might be to go with three piece body design because you can truly get that board flat. Maybe you don't even have that, you only have a four inch joiner. Well, that's gonna be a four piece glue up and that is a little bit excessive unless you're doing one of the environmental friendly um, slabs like I just showed you there. Um, so maybe you're gonna to have to do hand planing, okay? And that's something I don't necessarily recommend, but some people that's all they have. And if they do it well, um, it, it will be perfectly fine. But I'm not gonna show you that because again, the kids at school do have access to the tools needed for this. But what I am gonna do is talk about the process and show you how I square these up and I get it ready for and actually execute the gluing process. We already talked about the orientation of the grain. Okay, so the grain is converging with each other. That's the way I wanna glue it together. And certainly I can see that I've got almost a book match slab right here uh, because the grain sort of follows. Um, a certain path and it seems to be continuous from one board to another. So I think this is a really good combination for this, for this slab of wood. So what I'd like to do is even it up so it is the best match that I can possibly get, which just happens to be flush on either side because they were, they, they were cut together. Um, and that's the place that I wanna keep consistency. So before I even go and do any squaring, let me identify what side is gonna be up and what side is gonna be down. I'm gonna draw lines on the side that's gonna be up. That's not the side that's gonna be flattened, okay? It's not gonna be touched until after the glue up is complete. All right, so I'm gonna take just a little triangle here, and I wanna draw a line. It doesn't have to be perfect. In fact, I don't even need a square. I could just actually take this and draw uh, like a V by hand, and it gives me placement information so that when I'm gluing it up, I can kinda of keep my eye on it and make sure the boards don't shift. These flush up on the ends too, so we've got two ways to double check it. But this is a really good practice to do some sort of of triangle along the joint of where and how it's gonna be glued up. All right, so what you'll see is that when I fold this up, it goes away. When I come down, I can line it up to be right where it needs to be. That's a good first step for you. Now the second step is what I talked about is where we're gonna flatten these two sides and consequently then joint the edges on both sides. Now, assuming that my jointer fence is square, then I'm going to have a perfectly square edge from the reference side, which is the one I joint, and the reference edge, okay? And that will allow this to be glued up so it's perfectly flat together too. Now, if you struggle getting your fence square, it, it, I mean, a, a jointer fence sometimes can be tap, 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 up, too far, back, tap, tap, up, too far. And it's back and forth and back and forth and it's really kind of hard to nail it. You gotta spend time and you need practice doing that and you can get it really square. But, but if there's a, 
if there's a chance it's not perfectly square, another alternative is we can take the two edges that are run across the face of the jointer here and we can bring those two together, exposing the two internal edges. Okay, it has to be done this way. So to follow along with me. And then we take those two squared up faces back to back and the two edges we wanna square up on the bottom and we run it through our jointer together. Then if your fence is off a fraction of a percent one way or the other, um, this will make up for it. Because when these are then taken and then jointed together, any amount that is gonna be off on this side will be then compensated for on this side because we ran them both with reference side back to back, reference edge down, and we ran them together and they will book match open to a point where it will be a perfect seam in the center. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Put comments below if it doesn't make sense, but, but I'll show you how it's done. Uh, I believe my jointer is pretty square, but I'm gonna run them this way just in case. Again, a fraction of an amount off could cause this to kind of hump up in the center and there, therefore what it means is you no longer have a flat reference uh, bottom surface that you can then run through the planer. All right, so it's not a bad way to do it, especially if there's any doubt whatsoever about the squareness of the jointer. Okay, we're at the jointer. Remember, we've got the triangle um, on one side. That's gonna be the upside. So what we wanna do is we want to flatten the other side. So whether you're doing this with a hand plane or the jointer, or maybe any other special trick that you know of, um, we're gonna pencil up one side. That way we know when it's perfectly flat is when all the pencil lines are gone. All right, so we've got both bottom sides flat. And the way we can tell is if we go to a known flat surface, typically cast iron surfaces, if you have uh, any tool with a cast iron surface, uh, I could have done it on the jointer itself or the table saw here. I can lay it with that surface, that jointed side down, and I can begin tapping on all the corners. And if there's any type of rock there, you'll know it right off the bat. And both of these, up here to be very solid. Now, since we've got our arrow drawn there, that's where it's gonna be uh, glued together uh, because this is the side that we jointed. And because we jointed them together, I think what you'll find here is that these two will glue up perfectly tight and perfectly flat all at the same time. That is the important thing about the process that I just described. The best thing for clamping up body blanks is to use really sturdy I-beams. Now these are really beefy, but uh, pipe clamps or any like Bessie style um, clamp that you know is rigid and, and stout is gonna be good. And if it's done right and if the surfaces are flat, you don't need clamps all over the place. If you're worried about the edges coming out of alignment, you could certainly use some type 
of C-clamp to hold those two sides perfectly flush. But I'm not going to do that. But I'm not going to do that in this case because I am extremely confident that these boards are flat and these clamps are flat and therefore any deviation to the thickness of these boards I do not want to equalize. I want to force it all down so that any of the deviation is left on the top surface which we will then run through the planer after the glue is dry. So this is why I do it this way. Now another pointer, when you, whenever you're doing gluing processes with clamps, the best course of action is always to pre-stage the clamps to be ready to go. So you're not wasting a lot of time, you know, pulling everything into position and, 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 you know, turn in the screws so it, so it gets to the right position after the glue's in there. Do that before and that way, um, it is ready to go and you're not wasting time and you're not risking the glue drying prematurely. All right, so that is one thing. The other side benefit is this is called a dry fit. So I have just revalidated that everything looks fine, my V looks good, the orientation is correct. Now I'm ready to glue. Now, if you don't want to clean the mess off your clamps every time the glue drips on them, get some wax paper. And so I've got this nice piece of wax paper in here and that is going to put a barrier so any glue that squeezes out the bottom will hit the wax paper and will not go on to my clamps, drying on my clamps, causing me a lot of effort to clean them at some point in the future. Little bit of prevention. You don't need to do both sides for the glue to work properly but it does need to not be too thin. It needs to be a good coat. If you ever looked at the instructions uh, for many of these PVA style glues, they will talk about it being translucent, but still um, full coverage, okay? So that's what we're looking for. We can see through it a little bit, but we want full coverage. That's pretty good. Right there. It's going to drip out a little bit, but that's okay. I'd rather have a little bit too much than not enough, but you don't need so much that it makes a big mess. Now glue can be slippery. It might have a tendency to slide left and right. So what I would encourage you to do is tighten the clamps down evenly. Get one to start apply pressure, start to squeeze out a little bit. And as it starts slipping, just keep pushing it back into the proper place, wherever that is, and then tighten the next clamp a little bit. If you need a mallet, like a rubber mallet or something like that, to tap it back in place, then do that. Now you don't need to over torque these. You want enough clamping pressure to bring it together, but these can provide probably, oh gosh, a thousand pounds of clamping force. Uh, so it doesn't have to be Gorilla Gripped, but you do want a good squeeze out and you want a nice tight joint. Uh, and there's two methods to dealing with this squeeze out, is you can go and you can wipe it off, get some water and wipe it off, but the one side of that is, okay, that makes it look good right now, but some of that glue could seep into the grain, and if you're going to be using a natural finish on it, it could prevent problems that require you to get rid of all the glue that soaked into the grain. So for the most part, I prefer just to let it tack up and let it dry mostly and then come back in 30 minutes, 40 minutes and, and just take a razor blade and scrape off that soft glue and that will leave me with, with uh, a cleaner seam right there without the glue soaking into the grain. Okay, after about 30 minutes, I scraped the bead of glue off the top, and then when it got done, I scraped the residue that was in between the wax paper and the wood to clean that up. Uh, may need a slight pass of the sander to get that perfectly smooth, but as you can see, the same test as before with individual pieces, this board is still flat. Okay, so now what we have to do is just take down the top. Now there's critical dimensions that we need for any blank that we create. When we're working with uh, pretty much a standard 
Fender Strat uh, Telecaster style guitars, uh, the ultimate thickness that we want is 1.75 inches. Um, in this particular case, this blank, now that we've got it glued up, is only about a sixteenth of an inch thicker than, than 1.75. So I'm not going to take it to the planer, and what I would recommend my students do in that case um, is take it directly to the drum sander. So I'm just going to take it to the drum sander, uh, get it perfectly flat down to 1.75, and I'm going to call it good, and then it'll be done. This is for a separate project, and I may do something trickier with this that's not important for this particular video series. So I'm gonna put this out of the way. Now what we have is the two bodies that are gonna go with this series, the Strat uh, style build series. And, and this one right now is 1.75. And since this is gonna be a solid body, this is a stopping point, so there's nothing else I need to do with it, but that's what you need to do is in your final preparation is get all your blanks down to the desired thickness that they need to be. Now this one here has to be a little bit thinner because we are gonna add a top to it. Now I don't know how thin it has to be because you guys haven't picked out the top yet and probably because you just heard about it. Okay, so I'm going to wait until I hear from some people uh, and figure out what walnut, Clara walnut top you want me to use with this body to make a rear cavity, no pick guard, Strat uh, guitar. All right, and since this one's at the final spec, we're ready for the next episode, which is going to be the beginning of the routing and shaping of the bodies. And I'm gonna go over that in detail next time, but remember, I need your help to pick out a top. Don't let me do it myself, because I may pick the wrong one or I may pick one that somebody wanted to buy. All right, we cover wood selection, we cover glue up, we covered prep, and now we've got thicknessing and everything is ready to go for us next episode we're gonna get seriously into making some sawdust. So hang with me for part eight of the Stratocaster build series. And until then, remember, no matter what you do, start with excellence.